Well, guys, I want to speak to you uh, this morning on how to regain your life. <laughs> how to regain your life. Uh, I guess um, at various points, you know, some people are on, can be really feel like they're totally at the end of the rope uh, and they need their, their life to be regained. Maybe for, but for all of us, to one degree or another, there's a process of restoration, I believe, that God wants to bring in our lives. And, uh, and so I want to look at how can we uh, regain the life that actually God has for us. Because we know, don't we, there is a spiritual enemy out there, isn't there? Who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it in its full. Now, you have to forgive me if, I've shared, if you've heard this story before. But uh, when I was 20 years of age... Um, I went, on a, uh, I went on a missions trip, or not like a missions trip, kind of a ministry tri- trip uh, with another pastor and his colleague to New Zealand. And uh, when, I, when I arrived there, uh, I, when I arrived there, we, we went to, to North Island, and uh, my two traveling companions, they went to the South Island to do some ministry. And I, because I was a student at the time, I couldn't afford that. So I stayed in North Island in Auckland. And I stayed with some wax heads. Now, you might be wondering, what are wax heads? Well, I'll tell you what a wax head is. A wax head is a surfer. <laughs> so I studied with these guys, and they were surfers. That's what they call them in New Zealand. And then uh, one day, these uh, guys invited me to go for some surfing uh, just off the coast of New Zealand. And I said, yeah, I'll go along. Uh, one of these guys was a guy called Jürgen, a, a German-born Australian, now living in uh, New Zealand. Get your head around that. And he was, a, he was a youth pastor, and we, we, arrive at this, uh, we arrive at this beach. I remember very distinctively the black sand beaches that we were, that we were going to, and uh, kind of, cause saw the kind of rocky formations around, around the sea. And, uh, and then Jürgen says to me, because, because I haven't surfed before in my life, I got myself in a wet, wet suit, and I was going to do a bit of bodyboarding. I thought I'll do that instead. And so because I hadn't done any of this before in my life, Yuga says, hey, mate, watch out for that rib current. If you go out a bit far, it will take you right out. I thought, okay, I'll take that on board. I'll take my warning on that. So I, I went out uh, onto the sea. I got a wave. It was really good. Uh, and then I thought, you know, I want to get a bigger wave because that's what you want, isn't it? You're up for the adventure. So I just swam out a little bit more, turned around, waiting to get the next wave. And uh, I waited... And I waited. That wave wasn't coming. I waited, wait, and then and then I had this sort of um, ominous sort of feeling because I noticed that the surfers who a few moments ago were on my left were now a growing distance in front of me. They're getting further and further in front of me, and I thought, oh, this is not too good. And so what I did, I thought I'd, I'd try and paddle to the to the coast. So I, I tried to paddle, and as I was trying to paddle. Guess what? I wasn't getting anywhere closer. I wasn't getting closer at all. In fact, I felt as if I was getting further out. And then I had that sort of sick feeling in my stomach. <laughs> my mouth went dry. <laughs> my heart started to, started to pound. And I thought, I feel like I'm in a bit of trouble here. <laughs> and I was going further out. And, I, and then I tried, to, I tried to actually call for help. Uh, but for whatever reason, because I was so low down on the, on the bodyboard, my, my voice wouldn't, wouldn't pro- project uh, for whatever reason. It didn't seem to carry. And, and, um, and so I, I, at that moment, uh, I did what many of us do in these sort of situations. I cried out a desperate prayer to God. It was one of those prayers where I said, God, I promise you, <laughs> I promise you, <laughs> Lord, if you get me out of this, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, then, and then without any exaggeration, I, as soon as I prayed that prayer, within moments of praying that prayer, I looked behind. And where before there was no waves, there was this big wave just from nowhere, just appeared. And then there was this succession of three or four waves that took me back, uh, back to, to the beach. Uh, needless to say, I was quite relieved. Uh, that, uh, that I, I was back on, on uh, dry ground, and that, that, was, that was a good thing. But um, now, when we hear a story like that, you know, some people say, well, uh, was it a coincidence? <laughs> or was it a God incidence? Was it, a, was it God responding in, in that situation? I was in deep distress, 
and I cried out to God, and there was a response. There was an answer. In fact, a number of years later, I spoke to a, a fellow New Zealander, and when I described the beach where I was at, I described it was black sands, it was these rocky formations. I can't remember the name of the beach. It's some Maori name it was given. He says, you was at that beach? He says, yes, I was. That beach is notorious. It is notorious for people losing their lives. A lot of the guys got sucked under currents with those rock formations. Many people got swept out the sea. There's actually, there are actually sharks <laughs> further out in the sea. It was, it's a notorious beach. And I, well, I believe that day, I prayed to God, and prayer made a difference in that situation. God wants every one of us here today to engage Him in prayer. And the wonderful thing is that when we are in distress and we call out to God, He will respond. Now, when, when God says uh, something once in Scripture... That's normally an indication. You, you always pay attention, don't you? When God says something once. When God says something twice in Scripture, he's, he's firmly decided it in his heart that I'm going to follow through in this. When God says something three times in Scripture, you can, it's more secure than going to the bank. <laughs> and we even know what the banks are like today. But God, God is dead set on fulfilling what he said he will do. And he has made a promise three times in his word that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This should be the mantra of our lives. That's something obviously I can vouch for that day when I was stranded out in sea. And, I, you know, and whatever trials you may be going through, you can be sure that when you call on God's name, you will be saved. Sometimes the response is immediate, like I experienced that day. At other times, it can be over a process of time. It could be an addiction, a life-controlling issue, a life-threatening situation. It could be a stubborn sin. It could be a financial crisis. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, regardless of our past or background, God can enable us to regain life when we call out to Him. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we started this series titled The Redeemed Life, and we're looking at this great psalm, Psalm 107, which speaks of God redeeming and delivering people from very dangerous situations. And I mentioned when I started the series that, that life is a bit like a game of snakes and ladders, isn't it? <laughs> there are great opportunities, and we, we need to ask God to give us wisdom to know which ones to take, but there are also perils and dangers. And we need a wisdom in how we navigate through life. And that Psalm 107 shows us how God can help us navigate through life. Navigate through the pitfalls and the opportunities that life pre pre uh, presents for us. A couple of weeks ago, you remember, as part of the series, we, we saw that we are either slaves to our desire or to God's desire. God wants us to be servants to His purpose and His will for our life. But what I want to do this morning, I want to look at this truth, that God can able, enable us to regain life when we cry out to Him and ask, how can we regain our life? Okay, so let's read a part of this psalm. In Psalm 107, and uh, we're not, like I said, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it reads as follows. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Amen. <laughs> he cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and he cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. I love that, okay? Is there a common theme that's starting to come through in this psalm? They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. I love this bit here. He sent 
out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice, thank offerings, and tell of his works with songs of joy. Some went through the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred the tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at the wit's end. And listen to this. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. Isn't that wonderful? There's a theme, isn't there, that runs right through this psalm. Three times. They cried out to the Lord in their distress. They cried out to the Lord in their distress. And he responded. He brought them out of their trouble. We see in this psalm that there are a number of circumstances, situations that sometimes we can find ourselves in that are very distressing. It could be lostness. Okay, we all know what it means to feel maybe hopeful. Well, maybe some of us know what it means to feel being physically lost. I remember what I know, I don't know what that is. But many people are spiritually lost. It could be captive darkness. It could, it could be death, the face of death. Uncontrollable circumstances are just totally out of your control. You can, there's nothing you can do. And yet before and after each of these points, the psalmist says they cried to the Lord in their distress and he delivered them. You know, there have been various times in all our lives in sure where we experience distress. And in each of those occasions, at least for my, I know for myself, when I've called out to God, God has responded. Sometimes it was immediate, other times it was a process. Nevertheless, God still remains true to his word. He still remains true to his word, and he helps us to regain life when we call out to him. And so I want to look then at this question then, how can we regain our lives in the midst of our distress? The first thing we need to do is we need to cry out on his concern. Cry out in his concern. Regardless of what the negative naysayers say, God does actually care. He cares. Don't believe the lie that somehow uh, God has forgotten us or forgotten you. He hasn't. He loves you. He is a compassionate God. In fact, I was just reading, I was even reading the law of Moses the other day. Like the, the law of Moses. Like, come on, the law of Moses. But the thing that even struck me about even reading the law of Moses was how God cared for the vulnerable. God cared for the widow. God cared for the orphan child. God cared for, for the stranger, the, the, the marginalized. I just sense that all the time. God actually fundamentally cares. God is actually a compassionate God. Unlike the gods of other religions that are sometimes often distant or cold or hard-hearted, the God of the Bible is a compassionate God, and nothing can describe the depths of his love that he has for every person in this room and every person who's watching online this morning. And that means that whatever distress you're going through, understand God cares. He does. And he wants to help. When the psalmist describes the various situations that these people find themselves in, you see that after they cry out to God in their trouble, he brought them out of their distress. You know, God's care cannot be more clearly seen than in the person of Jesus. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. He's the exact representation of the divine on earth. In the, the, you know, there's a story in the Gospels where a, a, a man who was a leper and just you know, covered with leprosy, he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. I am willing. Jesus is willing God is willing to step in where we're at. God is wanting to actually help us in our distress. God is actually wanting to help us in our pain. 
You may be going through some real pain right now in your heart. Deep pain in your heart. God wants to help you in your distress. He wants to help you where you're at. Jesus is willing because he is moved by compassion. I love the number of times when when we see in the gospel that Jesus was moved with compassion. Every time he was moved with the compassion, he would heal the sick, he would open the eyes of the blind, he would feed, he would feed the hungry. And, and as I mentioned, given that the Bible says that Jesus is the exact representation of God's being, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He is willing to meet you at your point of need. He cares for the afflicted. The psalmist said, but you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and you take it to hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. He cares for the widow and the orphan. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. He cares for the oppressed, the downtrodden, the downtrodden, the victim of the crime. Do you know what? He even cares for the animals. He even cares for the animal kingdom. And what I find even remarkable, even when God brings us judgment... Because sometimes God has to judge a situation. Even when God brings us judgment, he still demonstrates his concern. You know, when God judged the nation of Israel, took them into captivity, he gave them 400 years to help them, well, probably more, to try help them change their minds. Sending prophet after prophet, demonstrating his concern. When God flooded the earth, he saved Noah and his family and, and the animals, but also the inhabitants had hundreds of years to change the ways. When God judged the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he rescued Lot and his his family. Even when God instructed the Israelites to destroy the Canaanite nations, he was still demonstrating something of his mercy because actually he was ending the detestable practice of child sacrifice in those nations. God, even in his judgment, God still demonstrates his concern. He's always demonstrated his love for humanity. And when you call on his concern in your distress, he will respond. And you know what I believe? When you call upon God in your distress, upon his concern, I also believe he will also put his concern in your heart for the broken around you. So that you will become an agent of his compassion, his love to the most broken people in your world. And so it's so important. Yes, let's cry out on his concern. The second thing we could do to, uh, to regain life from our, in our distress is to cry out on his word. You know, that the, um, we all know, don't we, that if, if someone is not eating food, eventually they will die, obviously. <laughs> and as much as physical death results from the absence of food, The worst death, spiritual death, results from the absence of God's Word. Now, today we see, due to the impact of of war in our world, skyrocketing uh, food costs, fuel prices, extreme weather conditions, is leading to more and more severe food shortages in southern parts of the world. East Africa is currently experiencing uh, drought at this moment uh, and hunger. Nations like Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Mali, Haiti, Nigeria, Somalia, South, South Sudan and Sudan, Yemen, millions are actually on the brink of famine right now. It's hardly even reaching the news. And look, guys, look, we know what's happening in the news at the minute, don't we? Our world's in distress, isn't it? Our world is in great distress. And we need to continue to pray for the situation in Libya, as well as the, the earthquake recently in, in, in Morocco. But you know what? A lot, a lot of these problems that we see in the world, uh, humanitarian problems, actually are man-made problems. Most of it's man-made. If nations learn to get on with each other, if learn not to fight, if governments get on with each other, actually the majority of these issues, the majority of them would be solved. If buildings were built properly when in, an, in a known earthquake zone, a lot of these issues would be resolved. 
And yet, as bad as, as famine is in the absence of food, the worst kind of famine is the famine of God's word. When the psalmist says that they loathe their food and they drew near the gates of death, in the Hebrew language, it actually says that their soul, their soul loathed the food. Is that, so actually, it was the condition of their soul. And now we all know, don't we, that conditions, that eating disorders like bulimia and, and um, anorexia are really conditions of the soul. It's, it's anxiety within the soul, depression of the soul, and, and it results to harmful practices, harmful practices in, in the, how they, in their relationship, people's relationship to food. And what that shows us is this. In this particular st- situation, the problem with these people who are in distress wasn't so much a problem with their bodies as it was to do with their inner person, with their soul. And so I find it really interesting that in this situation, when they cried out to the Lord, the, the Bible says in their trouble, and he saved them from the distress, listen to what happens. He sent out his word and healed them. <laughs> He sent out his word and healed him, and he rescued them from the grave. So what does God's word do? God's word ministers to the soul, isn't it? God's word ministers to the soul. Oh, I tell you one thing, guys. Listen, you want, look, we know it's important to have healthy bodies, don't we? We know it's important to look after physical health. But you know what? It's the health of our soul is more important. The health of our soul. And that's why we need to spiritually nourish our soul. In fact, if you're going through distress right now, more than anything else, you need God's Word in your life. Because it is the Word of God in your soul that is going to sustain you and strengthen you and help you get through what you're going through right now. Because His Word, not only just does it heal, but His Word also brings deliverance as we've seen in this psalm. When the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they fed off the manna that God provided, this was so that they could learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or comes out of the mouth of God. And obviously, if you're in physical distress, that you need immediate uh, food or medical assistance. You need a safe environment. But you know what? The greater and the more important issue is the distress of your soul. And God's word ministers to that. When you experience fear, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, for your rod and staff, they comfort me. If you're feeling overwhelmed by anger, in your anger, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. When you experience sadness in your life, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Whatever issue you're dealing with, anxiety, guilt, jealousy, pride, doubt, bitterness, these are all conditions of the soul, aren't they? (laughs) God's Word heals and delivers. God's Word ministers into that situation. That's why, guys, yes, not only do we need to cry out on God's concern, God loves you, God is compassionate, God, God cares for you, but also cry out on His Word but finally, uh, to, to, to regain your life, you also need to cry out on his strength. It's not often until we're at the end of our rope that we cry at the God. I mean, when I was on that body board that day, I was at the end of my rope. I had exhausted all my options. Okay, I'd exhausted all my options of my physical strength, trying to do all that I could. And I cried out to God and his strength. You know, there's three stories in the Bible where courage melted in the face of storms. We have the sailors. uh, We all know the story of Jonah and the submarine, don't we? Yeah? Yes, Jonah and the submarine, you know that one? And we know the story, don't we, that uh, you know, Jonah, God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. He says, no, I'm going the other way. He gets in a place called Joppa, sailing all the way to Tarshish, probably, uh, probably uh, Spain, somewhere in Spain. And God says, all right, that's, that's the way I want it. Okay, well, we, can, we, can make, we can arrange things. And next minute, there's a storm. <laughs> and the sailors are on board the boat, and, they're, and, and they're, their courage is melting away. 
with fear. They're at the end of the rope. They cry out to their gods. And we all know the story, don't they? They, they, you know, they push Jonah off, off the boat and the, and the storm comes. There's another sto- uh, story in the Bible of a storm where we have Paul on his journey again in the Mediterranean Sea towards Rome. And in the midst of that journey on that boat, there is a storm. And the sailors, they encourage melts of fear. They try to cut off the light boats off the, off the boat to escape. But in this case, the psalmist describes sailors in the open sea, and it says that they reeled and they staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. They lost their courage when they understood that there's absolutely nothing that they could do. Fear had so gotten into their soul that they no longer had any sense of coordination. They reached the limits of their capacity. Their resilience in their strength, their skill, and their wisdom had come to an end. Have you ever been in a similar situation? Have there ever been times in your life when you felt, I'm totally at the end of my rope here. I can't do this anymore. That's it. You know, there's nothing more that you can do. You know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, there's a story of King Jehoshaphat. And when he discovered that the Moabites and Ammonites were waging war in his nation, his kingdom, he was completely at the end of his rope. He realized, I can't do anything. My, our, our army is so small. These, these nations are so much more greater and powerful. There's nothing we can do. And then Jehoshaphat prayed this prayer. And I thought, what an amazingly honest prayer he prays, okay? And here's the man, he's the king of the nation. And normally you think a leader would project a sense of strength to his people. But listen to what Jehoshaphat does. Jehoshaphat says this, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. He's being honest, isn't he? No power. We do not know what to do. (laughs) Can you imagine the leader of a nation said to the country, we do not know what to do. I mean, that's really going to inspire confidence, isn't it? Can you imagine a Churchill said that? The darkest hour of the Second World War. We do not know what to do. But listen to this. But our eyes are on you. That's quite an admission, isn't it? He ran out of his power, his wisdom, his skill, and he cried out to God on his strength. And in the midst of this desperate situation, the Bible records, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. You have to forgive us, guys. There's a few few names here. We'll we'll get through them, okay? The Spirit of the Lord came to uh, Zechariah, okay? Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Methaniah, a Levite that ascended the Seth. Like, you really needed to know that, didn't you? Okay? And he stood in the assembly and he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Amen. There are some things in your life right now that you are facing. You just need to hand over to God. You just need to say, I I can't face this on my own strength, God. I can't. I need your help, Lord. I'm asking for your strength. I'm asking for your grace. Help me, Lord, to get through this. And You know, the Bible says we are to fight the good fight. But, you know, we fight the good fight with the strength that he gives us. There may be some fights that are just not worth fighting, guys. But the fights that are worth fighting rely on the strength that he gives you to get through what you're getting through. And I believe that as you do that, as you cry out in his concern, cry out in his word, cry out in his strength, he will help you to regain your life in whatever distress that you're facing right now. You know, for some time it's been known that the salamander and the starfish uh, have this amazing uh, capacity to regenerate whole limbs if they get cut, they, they have this amazing path. New, new cells and new nerve tissue and blood vessels are built and, and they, can, they can rebuild and restore themselves. And yet, as incredible as this process of renewal is, 
it is nothing compared to the renewal that Jesus does in our hearts when we give our lives over to him. Throughout the Gospels, the word that is often used for the word save is this Greek word called sozo. And literally, it's a very wide word because it can mean different things. It can mean, it can mean to be uh, physically healed. It can mean that. It also can mean to be saved from sin's penalty and power. When I read it around that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, it's that same Greek word, it's sozo. God wants to save, God wants to heal, God wants to renew, God wants to deliver. He wants to do a complete work in our lives. He not only does he want us to save us from sin's penalty and power, he also wants to restore our lives. I also don't believe, and oftentimes he brings healing. Sometimes I don't know why he heals others and he doesn't. I don't get it all the time, but it is that. Let me just share a little quick uh, testimony. Um, last, last Friday, the guys in the prayer meeting would, would remember this. Uh, I, I was... Um, doing the street church on, on a Friday afternoon. And uh, the week before this Friday, okay, so going back the week before, um, there was a guy who was just sitting just, you know, just out on the... Out, so we have these, like, these uh, gazebos, and someone will share a word, and we offer hot drinks and food. And there was a guy who was sitting there, and he was sitting in the chair, and he was having a lot of pain in, the, in his right leg, uh, a lot of discomfort. I'm not sure what the issue was, but it's been going on for some time. And I chatted with him and said, how are you doing? And I had a little chat. chat. And um, he was just talking about his issue, how, he, how he's in a lot of discomfort and pain. And, uh, and the guy, someone was about to come up to preach the word. And I think this is the most bit of important part. But he said, I have to go now. I thought, wait a minute, you're going to go before the most important part, which is the word of God. So I thought, well, I'm going to seize the moment while I can. I said, listen, do you want me to pray for you? He says, yeah, okay. So I prayed for him and asked that God would heal his leg. Anyway, he, he headed off. And, uh, and then Friday just gone, I was doing street, which, street church again. And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, this guy should come running towards me. <laughs> I says, hey, 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 uh, pain's gone in my leg. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Well, thank you, God. Thank you, God. He says, I've got a sore arm now. Well, I was almost going to pray for his arm, but he, he shut off. But look, God still works today, doesn't he? God is still in the business of restoring. He's still in the business of delivering. And whatever distress we're going through right now, if we cry out on him, he will respond. Jesus said, I am making everything new. Isn't that wonderful? I'm making everything new. And when you turn from all that you know is wrong, when you put your trust in Jesus, when you take that step before him, he will begin that process of restoration. Sometimes there are some things that happen instantly, they change straight away. For other times, it's a process of time that God brings about the restoration, and some things will not be fully restored into the life to come. When Jesus says, I'll make all things new. And I just want to invite you this morning, if you've not yet uh, put your trust in Jesus and turn from all that you know is wrong. I want to invite you to do so. Don't leave the service uh, this morning or uh, switch off online until you've done so. Get immersed in water in his name. Receive of the spirit and begin this life where you can cry out in God's concern where he meets us where we're at. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that, God, that you are a compassionate God. We thank you that you are not distant from our suffering. Uh, and sometimes, God, we uh, don't understand uh, why it is that we may be going through some, some tri trials and struggles that we're facing right now. But, Father, I just pray for, for those of us who are facing some real battles, Lord, God, I pray that uh, you will strengthen them in their hearts, Lord, that they will know the love of you in their hearts and life, that you will strengthen them in their inner being through your word, that God, as they will cry out on your strength, that God, that you will get them through what they're having to get through right now, and that God, that you will restore that in their lives, which has been stolen. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, if there's anyone here, or maybe you're watching online, and that you, you've not yet um, 
uh, giving your life to the Lord, I'm going to invite you just to, to pray this prayer after me. Uh, Jesus came to restore that which has broken our life to ha- so that we can have a life-giving relationship with him. Uh, feel free to pray this after me in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that have done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life and live with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.